back so we're in this sermon series here now. Um, and we're going to go backwards a little bit and, and roll forwards from it. Um, and so you can flip to Acts chapter 6. We're going to hit on a few different characters in your book of Acts today. It's not going to be one particular text that we're going to study. We're going to bounce for, for over several chapters looking at individual people. Um, but uh, I, I believe, in the same way I said about parents and kids doing ministry as a family together, in that same kind of way, um, I believe our country needs a ministry to it. Um, it needs God's people to step forward and, and move this country ahead. Uh, it's, it's Independence Day, of course, was yesterday. And I believe that this nation is the greatest nation in the history of the world. I, we were founded. I don't think we're great because of how great we are or something. But right off the bat in our founding documents, endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. All the freedoms that we have, all the blessings that we have that have been established right from the start, we're always pointed back to God who made us in his image. And because of that foundation, our country has grown, has, has been blessed. And I believe that is the reason why. There are plenty of countries that believe in, in human rights and all of this stuff. There are plenty of countries that have freedom of speech and freedom of this and freedom of that that have not experienced the blessing that this country has. And I, I truly believe that that is based on our founding that points in the way that aren't our rights. They're God-given, they're from God for us. And that is, is an important and a powerful principle that is at work in our country. And so, as I look over that, and I look, okay, well, it's the 4th of July yesterday, and we're looking at where our country is, is right now, and it's not pretty right now, right? Like, this is not where we all wanted our country to be at this point. We didn't, we didn't want to see riots, we didn't want to see shutdowns, we didn't want to see this stuff. And you, of course we had sin in our past as a nation and we're not perfect in none of this, but we, we, we want our country to move ahead and to grow in righteousness, right? And we watch the news and we just don't see much of that. And so I'm looking at it as an as a Independence Day, Happy Birthday America kind of thing. And what does the Bible say that Christians are to do in our culture and all these things? Because we're in this weird spot. Where we're told, you know, don't trust in this world. Don't put your hope in this world. This world is passing. This world is, is sinful. This world isn't going to accomplish for you. If your hope is only in this world, then you're to be, you're to be pitied more than anybody. Because this world is a mess, right? And watch the news. It's a mess. We're also told to be salt and light in the world. So we're not just supposed to give up and just walk out and say, whatever, the country can, can you know, self-destruct whatever, no big deal, my citizenship should happen anyway, what do I care? That would be the wrong approach, right? That, that wouldn't work. But we, have, we can't go too far the other way either, where we put all of our hope and our, all of our identity in being Americans and standing for certain principles of, of who, what America is. And so we have this kind of balancing act. We don't want to go too far on either side of this. But I, I care about my country. We, we ought to. It's the right thing. I care about how my kids are going to grow up and what kind of environment they're going to have. And we should. Um, and then we watch the news and we see that it's going bad. We see that bad things are happening. Trends are in the wrong direction. And, and you can look at the education system or you can look at the entertainment industry or whatever and you just see a kind of a degeneracy going on that's not, not good that no Christian should, um, should enjoy. Uh, and so I'm praying over these things, and you are praying over these things, I'm sure. And we're trying to make sure that our minds and our hearts are centered on Christ. And okay, Christ, our citizenship's with you, but our citizenship's here too. How can we best move this country in the right direction? Um, and I believe it, it has to start with us. I mean, you can base that on the founding documents, okay? We, the people, it, start, it starts with us. We can't count on our leaders to do it. Really. The leader's supposed to be following us. We're supposed to be taking the lead and electing them and so on. And so it comes down to will God's people take the lead instead of counting on some other people to take the lead. Hopefully the, we get the right governor or the right president. And if we get so-and-so, that, that'll fix it. Uh, and then half the time they let us down, or half the time they don't even get elected or whatever. And we count on other people to do jobs that the Bible and God and even our nation's founding documents would say are our jobs. 
complete the people, right? So, um, what does this have to do with Acts? Uh, you're in Acts chapter 6. Um, there's a problem. We talked about this uh, several weeks ago. There's a problem. There, there's some kind of discrimination going on. There's widows that are from in Israel, and then there's widows that are from that are, they're Hellenists, it says. And, and they're giving all this food. And the Hellenists, who are not from Israel, they're from the, the Greek world, uh, are, are getting discriminated against. They're not getting the same amount of food. And so the apostles say, hey, we're going to make sure we teach the Bible. And they appoint these six guys to do it. Um, it says in, in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said, please the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. This is uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through uh, 6. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and Rosalind of Antioch. And they sent before them the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And so I want to look today at what ordinary, common sorts of people do book of Acts. Because the book of Acts, you might think, well, that's about Peter and that's about Paul. They're the main leaders in Acts. Sure, that's true. But the book of Acts is dominated by all kinds of small-time people that are barely mentioned, that are not well-known biblically, uh, and yet they are the ones that turn out to be linchpins in an entire movement of things. And if you want to go back all the way to Peter and those guys, they were nobodies too. They were fishermen up in up in Galilee, and Matthew was a, a, a small-time tax collector that he liked. And uh, they were nobodies. They were uneducated. They accomplished nothing. But okay, but Peter and John and all these guys, they followed Jesus for three years, right? They followed him around for three years. By the time Acts comes around, they are they are somebody. They're they're important. They're leaders. And so you might say, well, Peter's a leader. I could never do what Peter does. He's he's a powerful leader. He's, he was with Jesus, so I couldn't be. I would argue with that, but our spirit is good. But not everybody's appointed for that purpose either. But I believe if everybody steps in line in the, in the purpose for which God made you, I believe that's an army that can't be stopped. That's God's people on the move. And there's no excuse to step out of it. And we make up excuses all the time. We disqualify ourselves. Where God has said, I died for you. The Holy Spirit that raised you from the dead lives in you. And I, yeah, but I'm, I'm not really that smart. I couldn't do it. Come on. We need to move ahead or our country is going to keep burning. And our world's going to keep burning and we're going to miss our shot. This is our time. God put us here during this time. Where is it? It's our watch. Happening on our watch. Whether we like it or not, whether we feel up to the job, whether we feel adequate, whether we like it, whether we know what we're doing, He put us here. You put our kids here, it's going to be on their watch soon, and it's our job to have them ready for that. Um, so these, these, these apostles appoint these seven guys. Okay, Stephen and Philip are the best known of them, but there's these other ones. They're not mentioned anywhere else. Stephen is introduced in chapter 6, he's dead in chapter 7. Philip is introduced in chapter 6, he comes up in chapter 8, and then he's never mentioned again. Uh, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas... Not really mentioned anywhere after this. But here they are, standing up, filling a spot that needed to be filled in that moment. The early, early church was experiencing internal strife. And God said, I need some people to fix this. And the, the apostles, the twelve, they, they have to keep promoting God's word and prayer. So they're not going to just stop and wait on tables. And they say, we need some people full of wisdom and the spirit of God to do this job. And Timon and Procurus and Parmenas and Nicholas and Nicanor, nobody ever heard of, they're the ones. They're the ones, and their names are written in the Bible, which that's, I'll take it, you know, even if it's just a mention, and I never, they don't, we don't even know what they did after that day, their names are in the Bible, that's, that's, that's something. And I would bet you, every one of them would have said, I'm not really fit for that. I'm nobody particularly important. I'm just... You know, I'm a new Christian. Everybody in Acts is a new Christian. Brand new Christian, right? They're new at it. These guys, it seems to me, based on their names and based on the problem at hand, there's Jerusalem Jews and then there's Hellenist Jews. These guys appear to be Hellenists. They're not from Israel. They're not from Jerusalem. They probably didn't follow Jesus around in those crowds. At least, probably didn't. Who knows? And they're like, what do you mean? Us? We can take on a leadership? We could accomplish something good for God's kingdom? We can do it? 
but they did. If there was some eighth guy along here who's like, nah, nah, I can't do it. He's not in there. He didn't get in. That part of the story's not even mentioned. If you make an excuse to disqualify yourself, you're going to be disqualified. You're going to miss the shot, okay? So Stephen from there, it zeroes in on Stephen in chapter 6 and 7. He's one of these guys. He's a powerful leader in the church for like a day. And then they kill him. Like it, it says he's, I mean, even longer than a day, I guess. He's, he's debating with these people and they get really mad and they can't argue with him, so they kill him. But he's, he's very brief. He doesn't last long. You can say, well, God, you know, you've got Stephen. He's, it says he's full of wisdom and the spirit. He's a great teacher. Nobody can debate with him. Why, why, did, you, why did you keep, keep that guy alive? Let him, let him run. And God says, I have a purpose here. And in his martyrdom, which we, which we studied a couple weeks ago, in his martyrdom, he, he provides this assurance for all the other believers. He's calling out, he's forgiving the ones who do it and everything else. And so God took a guy from nowhere that we ever heard of, promotes him up, makes, makes something big happen, and then Stephen's gone. That was his purpose. He stepped into the job that God gave him. He did it. He did it for God's glory. And, and, and his, his, his mission is over. Philip is another guy. You can flip over to chapter 8. Um, there's a Philip who's a disciple who's one of the 12. He's mentioned back in the lists in the Gospels of the 12. The Philip here in the book of Acts is not the same Philip. This is one of the deacons appointed along with Stephen to wait tables. Okay? He was not appointed to be a missionary and plant churches. He was appointed to wait tables. He's like, he, he, he's not, they, they, they didn't list him off as somebody to go and do this stuff. He's not qualified, you could say. But chapter 8 is all about the stuff that he did. That he was evidently very qualified for uh, remember Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem, which is the capital city, which is where it all happened. Judea, which is the province in which Jerusalem happens. Samaria, and the answer is Samaria is up north, they're enemies, and nobody wants to go there. Peter and John don't go there. Philip goes there. Chapter 8, verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word, and Philip went down to see Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Philip does. He didn't wait around for Peter to do it. He didn't wait around for John and the other guys to say, all right, time for a mission trip to Samaria. Who wants to go? Philip, you can come along. He didn't wait for that. He just did. He just went. The church is scattered. My job ain't the church of feeding everybody. Well, everybody's scattered. There's nobody to feed anymore. I guess I'll go be a missionary to Samaria. Because Jesus said we'd be witnesses to the Samaritans. And no one else is doing it. And I know Jesus. Yep, I'm a new Christian. Yep, I don't know much about it. Yep, I'm kind of afraid that this Saul guy might come kill me like he did my friend Stephen. Yep, a lot of uncertainty right now. But somebody's got to go to Samaria. And we're being chased around and hounded by these guys might get killed, so we can go to our enemies over here. If our friends are acting like this, maybe our enemies will actually be nicer to us. Let's go to Samaria. And he goes to Samaria, and uh, big things happen. The, the, the church starts in, in Samaria. Uh, the crowds, verse 6, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was much joy in that city. And it goes on and on, and there's this guy, Simon, who's... I do these video series, you can watch some of these. From, I, every day at noon, I post a video up through the book of Acts to go deeper on some of this stuff, so I can't preach it all. But uh, there's baptisms happening. Big things are happening. Why? Because some nobody got in Philip that barely made mention of in chapter 6, and then chapter 8, boom, that's his time. He steps out. He plants a church in Samaria, and then, then what happens? The next page, he, he's down on the way to Ethiopia meeting some guy, uh, meeting a eunuch. Um, it says in verse 26, he, he's like done his job in Samaria. He planted a church. Peter and John come along and, and kind of show up and validate the thing. And Philip's like, all right, I'm out of here now. Um, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And it's a desert place. So he has a thriving ministry, planting a church in Samaria. And it's working, and miracles are happening, and God is accomplishing things. And God's like, look, okay, go to the desert. Go to a road in the desert. And he meets one guy there. And he goes there, and he says, Eunuch, it's, it's someone who's been castrated, and he works down in he lives in Ethiopia. This is a person that a good Jew is never going to talk to. Read your, read your Old Testament law about what to do with a eunuch. They don't belong in the temple, they're not part of God's people. And if they're from Ethiopia, all the worse. They're not Israel. They're, this is this is 
This is not somebody that a good Jew is ever going to really spend time with. And Philip does. He doesn't go ask Peter for permission. He doesn't go ask the leader. He just does. Because God's talking to him and God's showing him and God's put him in his position. Philip, go and do it. And uh, the guy goes away rejoicing. Verse 40, Philip found himself at Azotus. Again, God just moves him to the next place. And then that's what happens there. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong verse. Uh, verse 39, sorry, that was 40. Um, when they came up out of the water, he baptized the guy. The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. It's just this one-off little episode with some guy, a eunuch, we don't even know his name. And Philip shows up, he's reading his Bible, he's like, let me tell you what that Bible's really about. That's about Jesus. And then, oh, can, I, can I be baptized? Sure you can. I don't need Peter. I don't need it. Just let's do it. Baptize him. The guy goes away rejoicing and God takes Philip to the next spot. And then Philip is really brought up again. He, he has jobs to do and he goes and does those jobs. And what happens next? He's in God's hand. The Luke who wrote the book of Acts didn't know Philip too well. Didn't ask him what happened next. Didn't write it down. Who knows? But God knows it. And, and Philip stepped in to a job that God gave him to do. Qualified or unqualified, didn't even enter his mind. Skilled or unskilled, what if he asks a weird question? What if he is mean? What if he doesn't like me? He didn't even ask. Just, here we go. I'll go to Samaria. I'll go to Ethiopia. I don't care. I'm going to serve the Lord. Okay? Um, from there, you get to chapter 9, which is the conversion of Saul. We talked about this last week. Saul is, becomes Paul um, and writes like a third of the New Testament or so. Powerful, powerful missionary to the early church. The book of Acts, by the end of it, is just Paul becomes the main character. But how does he start out? He starts out as the most unqualified missionary you can find. A guy who kills missionaries. Like, that's not the guy you want on your mission, Steve. He's going to kill him. Um, he, he's unqualified. Now, he's very educated. He's a leader in the temple. So he has a lot of these skills he brings to the table. But the one skill you need, uh, don't kill Christians. He, he's doing that one wrong. Um, he's, he's, he's way off base. And God's like, oh, we'll just qualify We'll just do it. Remember Jesus had always said, hey, pray for your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, bless them. Saul was that God. And Jesus did it on the cross. He, he, he prayed to God to forgive them as they crucified him. And so Saul is out here killing people. Stephen prays uh, for them to forgive them. Don't hold the sin against them as he's being stoned to death and Saul is overseeing. And then Saul is going around on this murderous rampage, locking up Christians, going all over the place to get them. And it just looks like this is going to be dangerous and no good. And then some random guy named Ananias, who nobody ever heard of, who's never mentioned before or after this, in Acts chapter 9, comes along, verse 10. Uh, there's a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. It uses that word disciple. The book of Acts uses the word to dis disciple to mean Christian. It doesn't mean like a special fancy Christian like Peter and John and the 12 disciples. When the book of Acts says disciple, it means Christian. When it's talking about the 12, they call them apostles or something like that. Uh, so it's a disciple. It's a plain, ordinary person who's a Christian. whose name is Ananias. And he is in Damascus. We talked about this last week. Why is he in Damascus? Probably because Saul was hunting down Christians in Jerusalem and he's hiding in Damascus from Saul. That's the, read the context, that seems to be exactly what he's doing there. Um, so he's praying. Uh, the Lord says to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. Rise up, go to Straight Street, house of Judas, look for a man named Tarsus, from Tarsus named Saul. Behold, he's praying. And Ananias is like, I know that guy, that's, he's looking for me. Um, he need to lock me up. I don't want to go to him. But I don't know, maybe he's remembering something Peter said about, hey, Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Is this an enemy? Yes. Therefore, that's the guy you should be praying for. Um, I, I don't know. Ananias would have been a new Christian. I don't know if he even knew the Beatitudes in, in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if he ever met Jesus. I don't know how well he knew any of the 12 disciples. He's a new Christian. He's hiding in Damascus. He's not in Jerusalem where the disciples are. Anyway, he's obedient. He's obedient to what God tells him to do, and he goes and does it, and then he's out of the story. No more mention of Ananias. That's it. What did he do next? Did he start the, uh, the kids' BBS ministry at the church in, in Damascus? Who knows? It doesn't say. He, he had a job to do, and he did it. And glory to God that he did it. What would have happened if he hadn't done it? I don't know. 
I, I know that God had a purpose for, for Paul's life, and he was going to accomplish that purpose one way or another. And if Ananias had, had punked out about it, uh, God would have still done it, and Ananias would have missed it. It reminds me, of, you might know the story of uh, Esther in your Bible. Esther marries Queen, marries the king of Artaxerxes, she becomes the queen, and there's this horrible evil law, and there's a guy named Haman who wants to kill all the Jews in the entire world, essentially. And Esther is, is a Jew, and she's married to the king, and she's afraid if I tell him I'm Jewish, but who knows what might happen, and he's kind of a dictator, not very good king, and he might just kill me. Uh, she's worried, and her uncle Mordecai, who's Jewish, of course, says, listen, Esther, you were raised up for this particular time. There's a reason you're the guy that married the king, and he could have married anybody he wanted, because that's the kind of guy he was. He married her. There's a reason for that. The reason is for you to stand up right now and do God's work in your spot, in the place that God has placed you in right now, and you're going to save God's people. And then Mordecai tells her, and if you don't, God will raise up another deliverer, and you'll die. But God will deliver his people. It's just going to be a matter of whether you're going to be the one that gets to see it happen. Whether God will use you to do it, or just wind up with somebody else because you pumped out. And so Esther, of course, does it, and it works. And here Ananias does it, and it works. And Saul becomes a believer. He can see again. And uh, Saul becomes a missionary. Um, we looked at that conversion last week. So from there, there's this other guy, Barnabas, another side character in your book of Acts. He's not Paul, he's not Peter, he's Barnabas. He's not one of the twelve. He's not even one of the seven deacons with Stephen and Philip. He's just Barnabas. Where does he come from? It mentions offhand that he's from Cyprus. Cyprus is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, not from Jerusalem. Not part of that movement, probably not following Jesus around Galilee and then Jerusalem for three years like the other crowds were doing. He's from Cyprus. He's not from there. And Barnabas is the guy that gets Saul into the church. Saul is converted in this strange kind of setting where he, God just kind of does it to Saul and then uses Ananias to, to reach him. But the, the church in Jerusalem, the headquarters, the leaders, Peter and John, the leaders, they're, they're down in Jerusalem. Paul's up in Damascus. And the church starts to thrive up in Damascus with Paul there. But then he comes to Jerusalem. And I, Acts chapter 9, verse 26. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. Remember, the disciples in the book of Acts means the Christians. He attempted to join the church. He didn't say, I want to be your senior pastor on day one. He just said, can I come to your church? That's essentially what happened. Um, when he came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. I don't blame them. This guy was out hunting disciples. That's what he did. Uh, last time we saw you in Jerusalem, you were on your way to Damascus to kill more Christians. So now that you're back, we're not all that happy to see you. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. That's the 12. That's Peter and John. And declared it to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and spoke to them and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. So he's a Christian now. Paul has converted to Christ. But they won't let him join the church because he's too scary. He's a bad guy with all this, all this history of him. Barnabas, this random character just kind of pops up in a few places in Acts. Very rarely gets more than a few words or sentences about him. He's from Cyprus. Barnabas goes and brings Paul to the apostles, to Peter and John and the main leaders. And he's like, guys, you need to meet Paul. You're not doing it. And for some reason, Peter and John, they weren't doing it. I don't know why. They were pretty busy. They had a lot of stuff to do. I'm not sure they, they I don't think it was sinful. They just weren't doing it. This, this Paul guy is an interesting character, and I don't have time to deal with that. Might kill us, might have a secret agenda. Maybe it's legit, I don't know, but they're they're too busy. They're not dealing with it. So Barnabas, the random guy from Cyprus, says, You guys, it's time to meet Paul. This is important. This matters. And that's pretty much what Barnabas is known for, whatever he's mentioned. He's the, he's the guy who sold all he sold his field and gave all the money to the church a few chapters before. And then these Ananias and Sapphira, this married couple, they try to kind of counterfeit it and they're more well known than Barnabas is. He's the guy who did the good thing. 
Um, and now he's mentioned again as a guy who's going to bring Paul into the church. Can you imagine what would happen to you if Paul becomes a believer, a powerful preacher and everything else, but never joins the church, never becomes part of the body of believers in Jerusalem, never connects with Peter and John and Andrew and James, never makes that connection. And they never really go visit him, and he doesn't visit them, and they run opposite spheres, and I'm going to go to Paul's church, I'm going to go to Peter's church. Can you imagine what kind of stuff would go wrong in a situation like that? Paul is, is not to be trifled with. He knows his stuff, and now that he's converted, he's 100%. He's not going to stop just and wait for Peter and John to accept him in. He's going to go do it, and that's what he's been doing. And Barnabas said, we need to make this connection happen. Even if it's a little bit uncomfortable for you guys, even if Peter, even if this guy already stoned to death your friend Stephen in front of you, you need to come together. And Saul, even though you did that, and you might be ashamed to meet these people and visit with them because you know what you did to their friends, Saul, you need to come along anyway. We need to make this happen. Barnabas is the guy that makes that happen. A no-name guy from Cyprus that, I don't know, He's not a no-name guy to God. Uh, a powerful, powerful thing's happening here because he took some initiative. It was a little bit of a risk. It was a little bit uncomfortable. It put people in a room together that was probably going to be an uncomfortable room for a period of time. Right? You ever try to make reconciliation with kind of an old enemy of some sort? Who wants to be in that room? Barnes is like, I'll do it. I'll do it by faith. I trust the Lord for that. So Barnabas steps in, and it happens. Um, from there, you can skip over to chapter 11. There's some more Barnabas doing some interesting things. Uh, a church gets started up in Antioch, even farther north. Um, if you can look at verse 19. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose after Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the word to no one except Jews, and then some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who are coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists and Greeks also, like preaching the Lord Jesus. Check out that verse 19. This, this is a few chapters later from Stephen. Saul has now become a believer and joined the church. And yet, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen have now gotten all the way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, even farther north. Over a sin, the son of Stephen, that's, that's kind of already been covered now. Saul, the guy that did it, is now a believer. He's joined the body of Christ. And they're still spreading. They're still spreading. How far could Stephen have gone on his own if he had just lived? And God had said, yeah, this guy's a powerful preacher. Let's just keep him going. Would he have gotten churches all the way up to Antioch? I don't know. Peter hadn't yet. John hadn't yet. That hadn't happened yet. So God is able to use all kinds of, even, even disasters, evil, Evil sin in the incited mob who stoned Stephen to death, a great innocent man, a teacher of God's word. God's able to use that to launch more churches. You think He could use you to accomplish something greater for His kingdom? Just, just little old me. I think He could. Um, so, anyway, this church gets started up in Antioch. Verse 22 the report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So the report of it comes back to the church in Jerusalem. They didn't start it. They didn't send missionaries to do it. Hey, guys, go start some churches up in Antioch area. We need churches up there and report back. No, these churches started along their own accord and grew to the point that people heard about it in Jerusalem. These are just, these people don't even have names. Okay? Those who were scattered over the persecution, those people. A group of them. How many? I don't know. Just some of them went north and got churches going up in Antioch, Phoenicia, Cyprus. A bunch of people. The Bible doesn't even mention their names, but God's kingdom is growing. They don't ask Peter, hey, Peter, can you come along? We don't know how to do this without you. Oh, we need, we need John. Can you at least maybe, maybe send the Dowling Thomas? We'll, anybody. We'll take somebody. You know, we'll take the JV team. I don't care. No, they don't even do that. They're just like, let's go. We're going to go with it. The Bible doesn't even need to tell our, our names we're going to do it. And then the church down in Jerusalem hears about it, and they, they have a lot going on. I don't want this message to sound like the, the, the 12 disciples were like lazy or something. They were doing powerful things, and the book of Acts talks about it frequently. I don't want to make it sound like that. 
God's kingdom had grown and was growing so quickly and so rapidly and just extending that there's no way these guys could have kept up with it all. That wasn't the point anyway. God didn't say, I've only chosen you to make disciples across the world. If you're going to make disciples, they're going to make disciples. That's the definition of the disciples. And he continues to modify God's kingdom. So some people get this church started, and they're so busy doing their stuff down in Jerusalem, they send Barnabas. Just this, again, it just periodically pops up. There's Barnabas back in action again. He's going to go. And he's going to, he sees it, he's glad, and he, uh, he exhorted them, verse 23, to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. I, I prayed that after, after worship today. Steadfastness is an old school word nobody talks about anymore. And uh, it means you endure. It means you persevere. It means you just do it. Whether it's easy or hard, you're steadfast. And Barnabas, who has been down there and seen all this stuff with Saul and everything else, says, these guys, this is exciting. They need some steadfastness if this is going to stick. If this is going to work and last grow from here, they need steadfastness. Um, and so he does that. Verse 25, he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Apparently Saul was off in Tarsus. I don't know what he was doing there. That's where he's from. But maybe Barnabas thought, I don't want Saul to wander off too far. I want to keep him connected to the broader church. Or maybe he thought, I need a guy who knows his Bible extremely well, better than me. And I, I'm friends with Saul. I'll get this guy. I don't know. But he brings in Saul. He, he connects people. He joins people together. He didn't plant the church in Antioch. He didn't plant the church in Damascus or Jerusalem. He didn't do any of that. But he draws people. He, he connects the church. He's the bridge from Jerusalem to Antioch. They sent him to do it. He's the connected guy. That's what he does. And now that he's in Antioch, he's going to go reach out to Saul. And if you keep reading Acts, they go on mission trips together and plant more churches together. Saul is the outspoken leader. Barnabas is the guy alongside of him, encouraging him, making him go. Uh, verse 27, chapter 11. Uh, in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. And so the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did this, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So now there's some guy named Agabus who's a prophet. She mentioned before, uh, some special prophet that Jesus walked with Jesus for three years with Peter. Nope. He's just not even a prophet. There's going to be a family, guys. We're going to need to bring some, some food and money down to the people in Jerusalem. They're going to need it. And so the whole church, all the disciples up here in Antioch, say, okay, let's send Barnabas and Saul down. There. And then and they bring it down. And so everybody is working together to bless everybody. Everybody's doing it their thing, their part. They can't all go down to Jerusalem, so they send Barnabas and Saul. They can't all give a million dollars, so verse 29, the disciples determine everyone according to his ability to send relief for it. This guy can do five dollars, this guy can do a hundred dollars. Whatever. Let's all do it. Let's work together. And now the church in Jerusalem, that was the kind of the fountainhead that started all, all these churches sprang out of there in some way or another. Now they're the ones in need, and this random town Antioch is sending it back to them to bless them. And God's people working together are building something that Rome had no answer for. That the, the nation state had no, no way to deal with it. The, the religious leaders down in the temple of Jerusalem couldn't stop it. It just went. Because gospel is a message. It's not a building. It's not a ministry. It's a message. And the message is new, it's news. News travels. News spreads. And the gospel is news. And so we spread it. And we do it in different ways. We have different skill sets and different callings that God's placed on us. And some people are going to be Paul, who are just going to go and they're going to be powerful. And other people are going to be Ananias, who's barely mentioned. But when the time comes and God has a purpose for him, he just does it. And I think if we, God's people, did our little thing, whatever the thing is that God made you for, if we all did it, it would move. It would spread. And the world would not stay the way it is. It would not just uh, an interesting little thing going on over here. It would change the world radically. Um, it would, our country, the, the trajectory that we're on of just kind of divisiveness, greed, <coughs> jealousy, anger, blame, finger pointing, whatever, you know, watch the news every day is something new. 
kind of evil being on display. Uh, that stuff, Satan's pushing hard, right? The power of Satan is on display right now. He's pushing hard right now. So what are we going to do? God's going to raise up a deliverer. God's going to move. He's going to make his purpose. He's going to accomplish it. It's going to happen. God's kingdom is not just going to, you know, burn to the ground and disappear because uh, the American culture decided to fall apart. God's kingdom is going to keep going. That, that will happen. That is inevitable. It cannot be stopped. The gates of hell will stop it, Jesus says. So if we know that's true, and we want to be in God's kingdom, let's get marching. All right? Let's get moving. Let's not play defense and just try to hold on to certain cultural expectations about what what I always wanted America to be like when I was a kid or something. Hey, that, that's defense. Yeah, we should play some defense. But let's go on offense. Let's hit the gas pedal, right? They're, they're, God has more to do than, than protect uh, statues or something, right? <laughs> that's not, his kingdom is bigger than that. Um, and he wants to use you to do it. And it, I think the biggest thing that stops him from using you is you. Whatever. Um, and it's mostly excuses, I, I, or, or fear, or whatever. But um, every one of these guys could have made some excuse. You know, I, I, I don't think I'm the right guy for the job. I have other stuff to do. Barnabas, Barnabas could be like, I don't really want to go to Antioch. Like, I'm from Cyprus, and now I'm in Jerusalem, and there's just a lot of chaos right now. I need to get my life settled down and, and build some, some roots or something. He could have said that. Saul could have said, yeah, I'm not a Christian now. Wow, man, I'm kind of sorry for the stuff I used to do. Well, glory to God, he forgave me. And then sat around talking about how God forgave me. He could have. You know, because I'm not, I'm not qualified for that. I used to kill Christians. Nobody would believe me. Nobody would listen to me. I, I'm so sinful, God couldn't use me for, for that. He could have said all those things. And he would and, and just never become the guy that finished out the book of Acts Romans through Hebrews or whatever. Um, Agabus the prophet. Who's ever heard of that guy? That's a funny name. You know, like, who cares, Agabus? You know, people dismiss him prophecy yet. I, that guy, if Peter gives me a prophecy, I'll listen. But Agabus, I don't know who this guy is, right? He could have he could have fed himself those lies without anybody even saying. But instead he says, you know what? There's gonna be a famine in God's going to be ahead of time. We can prepare for this. We can feed these people. And they do. Um, Ananias, he's, you know, praying for Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord wants me to pray for you. You know how hard that would be to, to walk over? Saul's been hunting for me, and now he's blind, so he can't find me. He's not supposed to go to him. You know, come on. But he does. He just does. <laughs> um, and, and Saul's like, hey, what did you say your name was? Write it down. Like, are going to hunt you down later or something? Um, can you imagine? And Ananias, like, I, I can't debate with this guy. This guy's a temple leader. This guy's a Pharisee. He memorizes the Old Testament. This guy, he has the, he has papers from the high priest. This guy's an authority, and I'm a brand new Christian hiding in Damascus. I, I can't, I'm not the guy. Sorry, God. Send somebody else. What if you ask me a hard question I don't know the answer to? <laughs> Ever wonder that? You're going to try to talk to somebody about God and then ask a hard question, and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do now. You know, call Peter. Go for Peter to do this for me. Whatever. Um, God wants to use you. He wants you to, he wants to use you in things that you're unqualified for. Peter was unqualified. None of these guys, even the, the main leaders of Acts, none of them were qualified in any any category that we would we would recognize. They're, they're, they're hicks from Galilee that nobody even likes Galilee. Um, it's just they're they're dismissed. They're they're not they're nobodies. And yet, because they trusted God. And just started taking the steps. A movement, a Christianity movement, came out of it. Um, well, the reason we're called Christians, uh, it, it happened to be up at Antioch, this church where, where it just started up from a bunch of people who literally about to say their names, and Barnabas goes up there. And uh, verse 26, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. If not Jerusalem. Not in, in the place that Peter and John and Paul jointly planted the church in, and that's where they called it Christians. No, not, not Jesus. No, the no name guys who were scattered in verse 19, chapter 11, verse 19. Those guys started the church in Antioch. 
amidst some kind of conflict, right? Um, and verse, verse 19, again, yeah, there's a bunch of them that speak the word to no one except Jews. Verse 20, there's some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also. So the church in Antioch, this new place, from the start is divided, Jews and Greeks. From the starting point, there's some unlearned who talk to Greeks. Those guys. That's where God decided to, to make his movement that becomes known as Christianity. And Barnabas, of course, gets there. They, they straighten that out. And that's not able to just let it ride like that. Um, because God has a purpose for you. God has a reason for you. He made you to do something. Kids, you have a life in front of you. A long life, I hope, to serve the Lord. He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for all of us. And the question is, are we going to do it? Tell me, tell me, if our, if our people, if God's people in this country started just taking steps, this country would change. It would change big and for the better. Amen. Uh, it would move. It would grow. It, it would grow in righteousness. I, I looked up um, the way you measure like how a country's doing money-wise, stuff that you call the GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, how much total value of everything that's produced in this country per year is. 21 trillion something dollars. It's big. Uh, and, and you want your country to grow its GDP every year and whatever. Um, and God obviously does not care a whole lot about how far, how high you can stack your money. That's not a big priority for him. Um, but what if we started measuring the country in terms of righteousness, God's righteousness, the gross domestic righteousness of this country? Where would we be? I, I, I don't know. I got Thing about dollars, at least you can count dollars. I don't have to count righteousness, but God can, right? Um, if there is a GDR in somewhere in God's uh, book or whatever, gross domestic righteousness, if there is that, who is the ones doing God's righteousness on display? That would be believers, right? That would be our job. I'm not going to count non believers to display God's righteousness, that wouldn't work. So if, if our gross domestic righteousness of this country is kind of on the downhill, which it seems to be based on the news. Um, whose job is it to, to rebuild this thing, to resurrect it? The us, right? The us. They, they, we can't count on Hollywood to change their values. They're trying to change the values of the country, right? Um, we can't even blame them, really, because they're just a supply. If there was no demand, they would stop producing that supply. It's not Hollywood's fault the culture is going bad. It's the culture and desire for what Hollywood makes. So they can make it. They make a lot of money doing it. Um, it's not going to be the politicians. It's not going to be, well, if we get the right guy in November, oh, that'll, that'll fix it. Right? I mean, you could get away with thinking that maybe before, but, right? We can't. That, that's not going to fix it. You can't wait on Peter to get John to show up and do the job. It's us. It's the little guys. It's the small town people. It's we the people, that's what our founding documents said anyway, right? Um, I believe God has a purpose for each of you. I think he has a purpose, like, literally today. And I think he has a big picture purpose over the course of your life as well. But those big picture purposes happen by taking that step every day. They don't just happen one day all of a sudden. Um, yes, Saul's conversion happened all of a sudden. But... The missionary movement that built out from him, that happened over the course of the rest of his life. Uh, and it relied on the guy Barnabas to introduce him and connect him there and to continue to promote things and push the gospel ahead. So God has a purpose for you today. I don't know specifically, personally, what God's purpose for every individual in here might be today, but I know he's got one. And I know it isn't just a hope that something happens and somebody else does it. That's not, that's not the purpose for you. Um, the purpose for you is where he is placed you right now. He might put somebody in your path today, like Philip and this Ethiopian guy. Or there might be somebody in your path already that's been there all along. There might be a big thing where you have to move or something. Maybe you're to be a missionary or to start a new church or something we call big. Or maybe it's to be right around here doing what we call little things uh, for God's kingdom. But uh, I'll put this out there, and I know I, I beat this drum a lot, but um, love your neighbor means meet your neighbor. And he's 
hard to love them if you haven't met them yet. Uh, if everybody in this country who's a believer simply met all their neighbors and interacted with them in a Christ-like way, I think we'd be pretty close that everybody in this country would have, would have a neighbor talking to them about Jesus. I think there's enough Christians still in this country that if we just did that commandment, you know, the second greatest commandment, the Lord your God is number one, the Lord your neighbor is yourself is number two. If we just met them and just did that, if every Christian just did that and connected and cared about their neighborhood, I think powerful things would happen. And, and it wouldn't be stopped. Uh, if you have a particular purpose, a, a calling, a, a, a movement to start or to join in some way that's going to create greater righteousness in the neighborhood or in the country or whatever, I think you should just do it. Well, I don't know how to do it. Well, just do it. Philip didn't know what he was doing. Just do it. Show up and start and see what comes out of your mouth and see what God does. Um, and it's, it's not about us, it's about God on display in us. And so who's the limiting factor? It's not God. So I, I, I don't know, I don't know personally what everybody's particular calling is for today, but if you, if, what if you just sent a text or an email or a phone call or a visit today to somebody that God puts on your heart? It could be somebody you barely know, but God puts on your heart. It could be a very close family member or a strange family member. It could be the neighbor you don't like and don't get along with or the one that you're best friends with. I don't know. But if you just did, if you just did the thing that God puts on your heart today and just don't care what it results in, it might not result in anything big. You know, I don't know, that was a, a good conversation. I, I called so-and-so and talked for 10 minutes and then said goodbye. And that's all it was and you don't think anything came of it. But you mentioned the name of Jesus. You say, ask them how you can pray for them. You say, hey, you know, in church today, we're running about how we should step out and do things. Just mention that. Plant some seeds or something. Let God run with it. Let Him take it. If we all did that, I don't know, this country characterized by greed could flip to generosity. Characterized by lust could flip to purity. Um, and it characterized by uh, violence it could flip to peace. Division could flip to unity. All of these things are easy if God does them. I mean, they're, they're easy. They're simple. And if we want to celebrate Independence Day and Fourth of July and, and look for our, our country as Christians, how we fit into this world and live for the next world, we do it by taking steps in this world in the direction of God's world and see who follows and see who we can lead and trust God for the results. It's that simple. I think if all of us did it, big things will happen. God, God himself is on the move. God is going to raise up a deliverer. It's going to happen. It's, it's inevitable. Satan's not going to win. This country may continue to spiral down. I don't know what will happen you know, like specifically in the future, but I know that God will raise up deliverers, and I know that God will make his name known, and his kingdom will grow. His kingdom will grow if there's persecution, and his kingdom will grow if there's not. If God's people simply grow it. I want to pray for you now. I want to pray for God to speak to you. And I want us to move. I want us to go in God's direction. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us for waiting for others to do things that you call us to do. Forgive us for making excuses for why we can't do it. Or why it won't work. Lord, forgive us for putting our trust in in, in a government or in some other leader. Forgive us for fear, for being afraid to step out into things because then when we step out, everybody looks at us and we don't know what to do. Forgive us for being fearful. Lord, we pray that you would raise up a powerful movement, a revival in this country of your people stepping out in faith. And Lord, I pray that you would raise up a movement as your people revive of drawing so many more to you. Lord, if you can flip this country, you can give us a greater righteousness coming out of this country than ever before. Lord, we know you can do that. And Lord, we know you want to use us. Lord, I pray that you would. I pray that you would speak to everybody here in this room right now. That you would give us, put something on our heart that burns our heart today until we do it. Lord, I pray that we would do it. And tomorrow again, 
and that we would just take these steps every single day, trusting you. And Lord, do is raise up your army of people across this country and across this world to move forward and get into action. Lord, I pray that you would do that and that we would follow you. Church, you know, I, I think this is stuff that God is already working on you on. And I think, I think it comes down to a matter of faith. Are we going to step in faith? Faith has to be tied to action, right? Faith and action go together. Just believing something in your head and doing nothing is not faith. That's believing something. It's useless. Um, he wants to tie it to action. And I think he has purposes for you. I, I know he has purposes for you. You know he has purposes for you. You probably even have them somewhere in your mind. I talked last week, I'll wrap up with this. Last week I talked about temptations. Temptations we usually think of as negative, as I'm being tempted into a sin. But God wants to flip those and tempt you into righteousness. And he wants to grab your mind and your heart and just keep putting this temptation in front of you until you do it. Just like temptations for sin works, it keeps coming back, it keeps coming back, tempting you to do it until you eventually do or whatever or until you put it to death by the power of Christ. But Jesus wants to tempt you the same way. He wants to put things on your mind, on your heart, that draw you in that direction. It might be a parenting thing. It might be a neighborhood thing. It might be a career change thing. It, I don't know. It might be learning a new skill. It's going to be something. And it's already there on a certain level. And he, he wants to tempt you. He wants to captivate your mind in that direction until you do it. And then you trust him to make it happen, to make it a successful thing. But God wants to do that, so listen to him. Keep your eyes open, your ears open to the Lord. When you're in your Bible, be in your Bible. When you're in prayer, and you're, you're praying, and, and you start thinking these things, and you're your drive to work, or randomly throughout your day, things come to mind, you're like, well, I, well, that's whatever that, that's God drawing you into righteousness. And I want you to listen to that and pray back to the Lord and say, Lord, I really feel like I'm supposed to go uh, do this, this crazy thing in the neighborhood or talk to that weirdo at work that I don't want to or whatever. I really think it's time to make a change in my family that's going to kind of rock the boat, but I can't help I keep thinking about it. Lord, help me to do that. And then, and then say, Lord, what's my step? What's my first step? And then and do it. And take that step. Go in that direction. If you don't do a perfect job, and you're following the Lord, and guess what? God will bring it to completion. He'll bring it to perfection. But it has to start. Okay? Lord Jesus, we pray that we start. Lord, bring things to mind. Draw your, your righteous temptations closer and closer to us so that, so that we cannot stop thinking about the things you're tempting us to do. And Lord, I pray that we can just go.